So, well, we've got a lot of time for um, kicking this stuff around. Um, does anyone have some, any burning questions that they want to start with? I've got one, but if anybody wants to go first. Okay, well, I'm going to start with my one. Um, okay, so it's a question to both of you, and it's really it is about chapter eight because there's there's an awful lot in chapter eight. It's um, it's both very deeply theoretical, and there's some lovely stuff about Popper, and there's some uh, you know some it really extends the epistemological themes of the book. But then there's a lot of technical stuff. There's there's the equations that uh, Lot has taken from Daniel Dubois. There are computer programs where he's actually tested the theory of anticipation with some actual data. So all of that stuff about the pictures, which get jumbled up and then get reconstructed, this is presented as a demonstration of the mechanism that he's talking about. Um, now, I, I think my question is, um, it, I, I suspect in the group of people that um, come to these sessions and they were asked to comment on um, the contents of chapter eight, I suspect that their commentary would reflect the themes that you've been talking about, which are largely epistemological for both of you. Why don't we talk about the technical stuff? Do we think it's not important? Andrea, would you like to say, all right, if I uh, may give an answer, I, I think there's two acts one is you make the distinctions and then you do something with the distinctions mm. and what george spencer brown as i get to know him and i and i should say a year ago i was very critical of him so uh, it's it's really by by going back and and reading him again actually it's only three four months ago i i really changed my thinking he's pointing out there is a step that's called making a distinction and we somehow have skipped that step and we have no excuse for skipping it because Husserl already was trying to tell us the mind makes distinctions so why so then George Spencer Brown is repeating it but the community is very divided about whether he made a contribution or not. I mean, some people think, but other people totally dismiss it. And that was 60 years ago. And so apparently what you're voicing is still this, this idea that this is trivial to talk about how we make distinctions. Well, this is, that makes all the difference. Because once you start with trivializing distinctions, there is no way of communicating with anyone. And we have exactly what uh, Klaus calls that we just say, I understand, but we don't understand at all. We just want to terminate the conversation. Yeah, okay. So um, what do you see as triv trivializing distinctions, Jamie? Trivializing is but well, while we tell me, okay, um, all right, my definition at the moment is when I open a logic, a textbook on the philosophy of logic, that's somewhere in the middle, a chapter on distinctions, and then it's a pragmatic uh, syn syntax and uh, semantic, the three distinctions. Mm. But it immediately jumps into logic is, is about infer inference, inferential thinking and syllogisms and so then and then it goes and and depending on the book it says that's the way the mind works but it never says the mind comes out of the womb making distinctions and it needs to learn to update how it thinks of itself and as a distinction making being and we see that at work in the text of george spencer brown now I'm not saying that he's perfect or that he's a god or whatever. I mean, there are things I have a trouble with in his work, but at least 
he says it starts with the mind making distinctions. Mm, okay. And and so I challenge you to to give me other texts outside psychoanalysis because in psychoanalysis this reasoning is explored, but outside mm -hmm. psychoanalysis that say a human a, a Neanderthaler, I call it. I mean, to make us really think about if we take biology serious, I mean, we need to think about how the Neanderthalers were making distinctions. Yeah. And how that made civilization possible. True. And I don't see a lot of literature that's encouraging us to, to do this exercise. Okay. Can I, can I ask the same question to Andrea then? Because I mean, again, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot in chapter eight, isn't there? And we're kind, of, we're, we're sort of talking around half of it, I suppose. Okay. Um, excuse me. Is it a question to me? I couldn't yes, hear yes. well. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Uh, um, excuse me. Uh, what is the question? It, that, that, that there is a lot in chapter eight and that our discussion tends to focus yes. on the epistemological aspects. Yes, I agree. Yes, it was my focus, the epistemological mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because, uh, of course, uh, we know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you want me to dig deeper in the epistemological dimension? Well, I, I think I think re reflect on the um, extent to which we are talking about epistemology when there's quite a lot of mathematics. There's quite a lot of empirical stuff in the chapter. Yes, there is. Uh, I, I agree with you, but my focus was uh, on epistemology basically for two reasons. So the first reason is uh, the great importance uh, uh, of uh, focuses on and devoted to Karl Popper's definition of World Three, which is, I think, is a pillar of the chapter. The, the second aspect I didn't want to cope with uh, um, in my epistemological presentation is that on the technical side, uh, for example, uh, when you're thinking about, about the drawing distinctions uh, and about uh, also uh, Sparrow Brown's thinking in the way Luhmann interprets as Brown's, uh, the first question I, I wondered about my, to myself Just give it a second. I'm sure Andreas will be with us in a second. Okay, sorry, there was an interruption. I'll be fast. When I was wondering about the mathematical part of the chapter, for example, mm. uh, but it would have been very long in a, in, a, in a debate and in a 15 minute presentation, so I yeah. skipped it. Epistemologically, the matter is if the distinction between hyper incursive, incursive, and recursive equations are differences which make the difference. Yes, that's right. And all of them are first level uh, differential equations. Uh, the, the outcome of the equations seems quite different, but uh, epistemologically, I don't know if the terms in the syntax, according uh, to Umberto Eco, and the structure of the epistemological general design of the research, uh, the difference. I can cut this bit out when we when we edit it. I can cut it out. <laughs> Hello, Andrea. Okay, it's different among the hyper 
sorry for the interruption. Again, it's not my will and not my fault. <laughs> not yours, of course, either. Hyper, uh, hyper incursive, incursive and recursive is a difference which really makes the difference. But I think we could write a book about it. So in a 15 minutes presentations, I prefer to skip this aspect. Okay, it's a bit so kind of epistemology. Hmm? Can, can I ask both of you then, what do you think Lot is trying to achieve in this chapter particularly? Because it has got these two dimensions. This, you know, we've had the sort of very practical Shannon equations of uh, economic activity in earlier chapters. But this is where we get a theory of anticipation um, being explained both from a theoretical point of view, Andrea's gone again, but, but being explained from a theoretical point of view and from a practical computational point of view. What, what's, what's, this, what's this really um, driving at? Okay, uh, I will give you an example if I got the question correctly, if I got the point correctly. Mm. Among the quotations I selected from Lot's chapter, there is a, a, a nice one uh, in which he states, uh, I'm reading now, the focus in this chapter has been on how an evolving system of expectations uh, can be simulated without an a priori sociological interpretation. I argue in favor of operationalization and measurement. Yes. I think this is the core of the author, the core of the chapter according to the author. Yeah. Hmm? But as far, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but of course, uh, Umberto Eco taught us there are the intensio, the intensio autoris, aut intensio operis, and the intensio selectoris. Mm -hmm. So there is the intention of the author, the intention of the work itself, and the intention of the reader. So, of course, I can try to give an interpretation of Lutz's work, but I'm not a Lutz. No, I understand. So as, far as, I, as far as I can try to. Uh, to put his shoes, uh, my, uh, my, my, my shoe size is different hmm? for better and for worse. Okay. So as far as I could understand, the focus in this chapter has been on how an evolving system of expectations that can be simulated without an a priori sociological interpretation. I argue in favor of uh, operationalization and measurement. I give you a quick example. It's not an example by Lut, it's an, it's an example of mine. So uh, forgive me, it's a, maybe a bit provocative or maybe, you know, not uh, consistent with the chapter, but I mean, we are trying to deal with uh, the thought of our beloved Lut. Hmm? I, you know, and um, when I think about the horizons of expectations, uh, also thinking in terms of the word taken for granted by Berger and Luckman, I can simply think about the ecological debate everybody today is involved in. Both people, both organizations, both political parties who state that uh, there is an ecological uh, uh, disaster there is a climate change which is going to impact on our lives very dramatically and so forth. And people will say, I don't care, it's not true, it's just conspiracy. So the, the, the two extremes, uh, they are both talking about uh, horizons of expectations. They are not talking about reality. Okay, yeah. Because, uh, so they, they move on the horizon of the future, the horizon of expectations. So they might be wrong, they might be right, but there is no way in this moment uh, to say empirically who's right and who's wrong for the, matter, for the very basic reason that data, sorry, that the future, a future has no data. Mm. Data belongs to the construction of the past. And then you can try to foresee forecast or foresight, but you have no data about the future. That's why epistemology is more important than empirical research from my point, from my point of view in this case. 
Okay. All right. That's this is this is. I think this is extremely interesting. Right, Jerome, you've had your hand up. Right? So, uh, ca can I perhaps uh, re respond to Andrea because, um, and also to your question, and then of course I want to listen to what, what Jerome uh, uh, Jerome's comment is. There is a, a huge disconnect in this chapter, and, and that is, I think, what Andrea is pointing out, and that is uh, the, the failure, not paying attention to the distinction. Just between, before anticipation, there is imagination and fantasy life, and, and that is totally ignored how the, the fantasy life of, of human beings is being stimulated and, and the directions it makes them go. And what I also find a little bit shocking in the chapter is uh, discursive knowledge is about books. And so books, we, we write and design them, and now we read and use them. And there is no discussion in the chapter of what is happening. Uh, the fact that we actually need to read a book to, to do something with it, uh, and that we need to write a book. And so that's totally ignored. And instead, there is this abstract talk about uh, Shannon's theory of communication, and Shannon clearly said he wasn't talking about reading and writing, he was talking about telephones communicating with one another. So what I see in chapter six, uh, so, uh, sub chapter eight, is all these abstract words, and now we have the practice of the distinction between the spoken and the written word, which is not at all clear in Lute's stick figure, uh, whether it's the written word or the spoken, or whether it's the unspoken thought. Uh, so there's no attention to the reading and the writing and the fact that the human brain, as Tobias was alluding, uh, when we speak, uh, listen, read or write, we, we, we deal with distinctions in a very different manner. So, so there is no, as far as I'm concerned, there's no touching on the empirical reality. Instead, there's a some some fantasy reality where, where there are all these mathematical equations running around mm. but there's no effort to connect it with reality and and i'm setting here it up as a lexicon if if Lud had given me a lexicon where every one of these terms was translated in something that very clearly say now i'm talking about reading now i'm talking about the university that's doing a good or a bad job to teach was involved with reading if he had given a lexicon, then I could do something with the mathematical equations, but he hasn't done it. So that's the reason I'm not talking about them. So, I mean, basically your answer to my question is you say it doesn't add up. And that's why that's why the sort of focus is falling on the epistemology. That's nicely yeah. summarized. OK, all right. Jerome. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. We're so all having crazy I, internet days today. Well, I'm uh, in a cafe here in Berlin. So uh, I, it says Frankfurt. I'm actually in Berlin. Um, so I'm not sure how good my internet here is. And I did not hear Andrea's uh, presentation, unfortunately, or only the last few sentences. So I will mainly react to, uh, to Margareta's. Um, although I found what Andrea just said, the, his last comments quite interesting. And they reminded me just in this in aside of um, a conversation I was having with my own partner, who is um, the head of human resources in a company, so has some uh, sort of practical experience uh, talking about, you know, cultural differences working for a Japanese company. And he, uh, when I was explaining this chapter to him, actually was saying, well, this sounds like a very Japanese way of thinking. Anyway, so that's just sort of sort of an aside uh, on that, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, or maybe I can invite my partner to sort of tell his uh, opinion. But okay. So to my comments, um, I, I was following you, uh, Jamie or Margareta, uh, as you were talking about this uh, snake tail perspective and the seismogenesis, uh, you know, the dangers of, of sort of unconstrained positive feedback that the academy is, is, is adumbrated in that or is uh, implicated in that. Um, however, I did not so much follow you as your comments became more, uh, I guess, reflective of the contents of chapter eight. I, I'm not sure, uh, in short, to what extent what you're saying actually reflects what's chapter eight. So you say that there's a combination of PAPA and then something computational you say there. To what extent is that the case? I'm not sure I see it. Um, you also talk about the need for a friendly discourse rather than a critical discourse. I think these are rather sloppy terms. 
Uh, I'm not uh, very fond of, um, you know, looking at things like good or evil or, you know, it's nice or, you know, <laughs> you, you see where I'm, where I'm getting to. I think that, you know, one could be friendly and critical or to what extent is being friendly necessary to lead a uh, productive, um, you know, intellectual debate. Uh, it, uh, that's questionable. So to what extent are these mutually exclusive categories? So uh, following that, you know, to what extent is it a useful distinction, as you say? Um, also, you know, which metaphors are you referring to? And uh, as far as you say, you know, not making the, uh, the distinction, I have the sense actually from my background that there are plenty of distinctions made in this chapter particularly, uh, in particular, uh, well, in reference to what Andrea just mentioned, the distinction between the recursive, incursive, and hyper-recursive uh, notions, certainly those are quite formal terms, but, you know, if we look at, you know, the arrow of history pointing in one direction and pointing in the other, and the distinctions that that entails due to our, you know, limited knowledge of the fourth dimension, you know, we're moving in one direction, so thinking in either one, in either direction uh, has, makes, makes a difference. So, yes, I think that there's a little bit of a tendency uh, of late here in the group to pile on loot and accuse them of things that I don't think are quite fair. So yeah. I was thinking of the picture of Atlas, you know, Atlas, the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, mythological figure who's carrying the world, you know. Uh, we are not Atlas, uh, loot is not At Atlas, I'm not Atlas, and neither of, none of you are. Uh, we all have, you know, a certain perspective, a certain background, a certain training, and are looking at the world from that lens. And I do think that Lut uh, in his uh, heart is open to a you know, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary dialogue. I find his contributions very uh, meaningful. Um, you know, whether his approach uh, applying this sort of derivation of Shannon's theory of information is the right approach, you know, we can debate about that, but I, I do uh, uh, you know, honor him or, or, or but I have some respect for you know, this, this attempt, this, this uh, perspective. So I, yeah, I would appreciate a little bit less sort of piling on, you know, you forgot to do this, you forgot to do that. And um, yeah, so I think that there is a lot to be said of this perspective that he brings in from Husserl, this notion of intersubjectivity. So I, I, yeah, I do find some of these criticisms a bit off base. That's my comment. Thanks, thanks Jerome. Um, I, I think one of the things about doing a close reading like this is that it does it's good to actually focus on what we're reading. It's very tempting to um, uh, sort of talk about what we'd like to have read, which perhaps reflected um, uh, what we wanted to say, but you know, it, we have to go back to the text. Um, and I do think, I, I mean, I think this, this chapter is hugely ambitious, um, which I, I really like, um, whether it's um, right, I don't think it's a matter of whether, whether it's being right, but it's joining together things which are not often connected in this way, particularly the philosophy and, and, and actually computation. Um, Jamie, can I ask you, because you said something about the Lope being caught in a double bind. I wonder, you know, a double bind is a very specific thing. Where do you see the binding? Where do you see the contradiction and the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the prevention of people actually talking about the bind that they're in. Jamie? Where is she? Jamie? Really, it's like some sort of um... <laughs> Jamie. You're muted. Unmute myself. All I... right. All right. Yeah. Uh, no, you're now back. I'm, I'm, are I in the right slide or in the wrong slide? Yeah. Well, we're see I'm seeing thank you on the screen. Yeah. Then I'm in the wrong yeah. slide, <laughs> and I'm going to give it again. So uh, this, there is a talk about objective knowledge and it can be understood as a book. And so a book is something that we read. And when we read, we use a metaphor. 
and and we have a choice among five different metaphors to argue and the very popular one is the war metaphor and jerome is problematizing it and that's exactly what i'm doing i say if we don't talk about metaphors then everyone is going to think we're at war with each other and we can't really criticize and we cannot have the the good productive discussion and we really need to talk about our metaphors to to stop going in the uroburo circle of accusing each other of piling up and not respecting and i'm trying to give flute uh, a lot of credit i mean that's the reason i'm organizing the book reading uh, with you mark uh, but it is there is still the double bind for me is to celebrate the computer metaphor or the computational metaphor while at the same time pointing out that we need another metaphor that, that needs to be at the same level as the computational metaphor and that other metaphor will allow us to talk about how are we arguing do we really need to use the war metaphor can we find another one what do we do what do we need to do to stop taking it all personal because um there is another quote that i didn't use where lou talks about the distinction between objective and subjective knowledge and it's at the subjective level that we take it personal and if we keep that separate from the objective then the problem is less yeah i'm just i'm just thinking that the specifics of the double bind though would be I mean, as I'm picking up from what you're saying, that on the one hand, this is a computational, um, a computational metaphor, as you put it, and then there's a, um, let's put it, an epistemological, and you're saying that they're in conflict with each other, which I can understand, and, and those are those are communications at different orders, different levels. But the only thing about the double bind is that Bateson is very clear that there is a an injunction to say that you can't step out, you can't actually describe the dynamics that you're in. And I cannot see that there is any such injunction in Lowe's. In fact, there is an invitation to step into these dynamics and to see that actually there are these different descriptions. And yes, they do get along rather badly sometimes, but actually we need to, we need to be able to find our way through these things. So I think I would say it was the opposite of a double bind. Actually. Okay, uh, if if you say it like this, then my question to you is: Where is the lexicon where the translation is between the epistemological part and the computational part? Because that is where the invitation is supposed to be. Uh, so that it allows you to to switch and see how to move from one metaphor to the other and. I don't see it. Uh, if he had explained how hyper recursive and I, I gave you the list of all the difficult words. If, he, yeah. if there had been a lexicon to say, this is what it means from the angle of reading. This is how it connects to writing. This is why we have a, a department in hermeneutics. Uh, he's very close, okay? He's very close because he says a lot of those things, but he never says here is the lexicon. That's what I mean. Okay. I think the, the can I just ask, what, what, what do you mean, Jamie, by, excuse me uh, for interrupting, but what do you no, mean by computational? I'm, I'm just curious, what is the distinction for you, Margareta, for, between the epistemological view, uh, you know, how do we know what we know, and the computational view? So how do you define this distinction? Um, I can define well, it if you wish. Go on, uh, Jerry. <laughs> well, I'm actually just I'm actually curious to hear how Jamie is making this distinction because it's well, important okay, to understand okay, what she's saying. Let, let, I'll, well, okay, let her give her distinction and then I'll give mine. All right. Okay, uh, there is a book by Stephen Pepper, uh, the title "World Hypothesis," and he sets up the human mind as switching among different root metaphors. And so the computational metaphor is where we think like calculators 
and we compute. The word is computing. And now we have actually computers uh, to, to actually have a model. And uh, Gottfried Leibniz was the first one who kind of came up with this idea of people talking in numbers and that the higher number was the better one. And so now an other root metaphor is to think of humans as classifiers. Because they have a filing cabinet and everything needs to be classified. And um, uh, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn uh, discusses this, how these metaphors are, are at work in his book. Uh, and then, uh, a fourth metaphor is the puzzlers. Uh, this is where we have all the pieces in the puzzle that we try to put together, like what Mark was doing is the mathematical piece with the epistemological piece. And now we have the gestalt switchers or the, the, the dramaturgical metaphor, so to say, that, um, that actually have a, a long tradition, but we just need to pay attention uh, to it. That kind of focuses on, um, on um, the gestalt or, or difference or life is theater. Uh, Erwin Goffman uh, is a sociologist who worked on it, but Bertolt Brecht uh, did some innovative work in the theater to point it out. And then in, in the research on creativity, they call it the aha erlebnis, a new gestalt has formed. So I'm pointing out different big frameworks or, or root frameworks that can be used to compare and contrast. So we never step out of a framework, we actually switch among frameworks. Jamie. That was very useful. I am now curious, this is a follow-up question to you, Jamie, to what extent it may not actually be uh, mutually exclusive the view that uh, Luz is uh, proposing, they just, we take these three uh, recursive, incursive, hyper-incursive, uh, whatever you call those perspectives, uh, to what extent is th this perspective, uh, is there potential for isomorphism or similarity to the, uh, say, the Gestalt shifting view or one of the other views that you just mentioned? To what extent is it necessary that uh, this uh, this phrasing that Ruth uses is necessarily computational. I have the feeling, just to say, sort of reveal my thoughts, that you have a little bit of a a math uh, aversion. So, to me, just because that somebody's using a function with a sub uh, a um, what do you say a sub a um, uh, uh, you know a time indicator t or t plus one minus one does not necessarily mean that somebody's computing. So this could just be, again, a, a symbol for, say, an imaginary uh, thought that somebody's having that, you know, it sort of incurs from the, fu from the future, alien. It, to me, it's, I mean, fill, fill, the, fill in the blank. So the question is, to what extent do you think it is an essential distinction between these various points of view? Or to what extent can there be a, a shared uh, epistemology or shared uh, worldview? Jamie, you're, you're on mute again. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, for those who think I have a math aversion, uh, I have a background in uh, engineering. Uh, so I, I like to think of myself more <laughs> as someone who has been thinking about mathematics for 60 years. But you're welcome uh, to, to think what you think, Jerome. But, but this is really about how are we talking about the unobservable? And what are metaphors uh, doing in guiding a conversation? And the computational metaphor is one metaphor that is easy to grab and, and do things with. So it's attractive because it's easy. But does it help us understand difference? And that is what uh, George Spencer Brown is talking about. And that is what Luke is also wanting to talk about. And that is what innovation research wants to talk about. And can we talk about innovation by focusing on identity? Uh, if we start by assuming everything is identical to itself, and by the way, that has nothing to do with computing, that's just a working hypothesis. And a working hypothesis 
can that help us get anywhere? And and that is when we take the computational metaphor and we over identify with it. So if that is helpful. I'm talking about over identifying with the metaphor to the point that you think it is reality. I'm trying to say that's not a good idea. And how can we avoid it? By talking about the metaphors that we use and discuss both their positive and their negatives instead of um instead of making it an either or it's it's um it's both none of the above or something andrea um well, well J jerry was going to give his um uh yeah computational thing and then andrea jerry yeah um so let me take myself off video here uh so i'm i'm sorry i had another zoom meeting that i had to attend this morning uh so i missed much of the conversation but uh having said that just picking up and restricting my comments to uh jerome's particular comments because he seems uh or, or as i understand his expression he places great confidence in the value of uh how should we say, using mathematical terminology uh, in, in a way that um, uh, is used as guidance for how to visualize or, or to fantasize about uh, various um, issues that, that are at hand. Uh, and, and this, I think there's a limitation here that is very strong when one wishes to use mathematics uh, to express very complicated or difficult concepts or uh, things that are, shall we say, high dimensional uh, inputs and outputs from a system's point of view. And uh, I, I would say here then, then, I personally use the method developed by Aristotle uh, which starts with, if you want to use mathematics, first you do an analysis of the system, and then you use your analysis and the, the lexicon that you developed in the analysis uh, to do the synthesis. And uh, this is how you construct propositions appropriately uh, is in that context. So the, uh, in the case of information theory and Shannon's work, and particularly in Lutz's usage of, of uh, mathematics, uh, I think you have to understand that when you do an analysis uh, of a real system to get down to, uh, if you would, something equivalent to information theory, which is basically Boolean algebra and uh, the transmission of numbers for as part of communication, so that the uh, that level of analysis removes all of the uh, meaning from the symbols. So when you do the analysis, you get it down to uh, numbers that you can transmit by and compute upon. Then you have removed all the attributes of the system and have gotten down to zeros and ones. If you're gonna do synthesis from this point of view, you now have to reconstruct all the relationships among the numbers. And this problem of uh, synthesis is where you are very, very constricted by what you can compute. Uh, generally speaking, the general public uh, believes that if you have some mathematical equations, you can compute anything. Uh, well, that's not the case at all. Computation is a very, very limited form of the use of mathematics. Uh, it's extremely limited in what you can compute, but this is not general knowledge, all right? And uh, it, it's uh, well known within the computer science community. They have a whole vast array of terminologies, of lexicons, of, of what you can compute and what you cannot compute. Uh, now, certainly in, in the case of Jerome's usage of the word isomorphism, that is a, almost a meaningless term from a mathematical point of view. Uh, 
it does tell you that you have the same forms, but that, that's not, you know, all, most women have similar forms. Does that tell you how to compute something about a woman? I, I don't think so. Oh, I think uh, so, there are some computer scientists that believe it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So that's really all I wanted to say is that when we want to introduce mathematical terms in the sense that, that Lut is seeking to introduce them, and I, I would say I've followed his work you now for 15 or 20 years, and I've also followed the, the work in, in, of, uh, of uh, Dubois, uh, who is a personal acquaintance and colleague of mine for the same length of time. And uh, this, uh, this use of mathematics is, uh, it's very useful in its own domain, but it has very severe limitations of, of what you can conclude about it or what sort of metaphors you can build from it. Okay. And all right. that's, that's okay. basically all I want to say. Okay. Uh, Andrea, thank to that? Andrea, thank you for being patient. Um, you no problem. This. My pleasure. May I say something? Mm. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we are, I think there were very stimulating discussions. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, maybe very interesting and also wide, uh, and maybe a, li a little far away from uh, chapter eight we are debating. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, that the matter of the double bind uh, is something which should be clarified better, not just by Jamie. But in general, uh, also in Lutz's book, because Lutz, uh, at the very beginning of the book, not in chapter eight, uh, states uh, as pillars of uh, his own work, uh, uh, three, three sources, Niklas Luhmann, systemic theory, Shannon and Weaver, uh, mathematical theory of information, and the anticipatory system theory. As far as I know, especially in Luhmann's case, none of them is based on the double bind. No. Especially Luhmann. Luhmann is very clear in the distinction between a system and environment. There is no, no, there is no double bind in Luhmann's work. It's a, it's a self-referential selection of meaning from an outer noisy Humwelt, to use a German word, no, a kind of outer environment. Also in uh, von Furster's uh, observing system, we have the definition that the environment is what it is, uh, because as far as you cannot uh, select noise among noise, but just distinguish uh, noise from communication or communication from noise. When you are in the middle of the noise, you just get noise. So there is no way, according to Luhmann's uh, self-referential concept of complex systems to have uh, a double bind. There is no way. So um, my, my point is that your stimulations were very, very important, uh, very good elicitations. But uh, if we are debating Lutz's book in general and chapter eight in particular, also in the, in the terms of um, the founding, uh, what, uh, what uh, Lutz calls, calls the discursive knowledge, uh, I. I think it's a matter of self-reference, uh, which is not a bad thing, <laughs> just a matter of self-reference, not a matter of double bind. That was my, that was my comment. Okay. All right. So can I respond to, can I respond to Jerry because he did address me in his comments, just to say, uh, I, in anticipation, I uh, am not a fan of math at all. In fact, I mean, I have a training as an economist and I've always been very critical of the uh, physics envy and the math fetish that many economists, uh, you know, particularly uh, macroeconomists have. And I think it is actually in this regard, and given my training, that I find Luke's contributions very useful because economists generally, they have a, a econometric approach. They crunch some numbers, they put some uh, data, mainly referring again to the past, we're all referring to the past, as Andrea said, you have data from the past, but you don't have data from the future, that's impossible. And uh, so uh, this approach that Luke has with these, uh, I guess you could call them functions, uh, are, are and again, and for me, an epistemological 
tool to explain to economists who might be still living in the Stone Age that, in fact, it may be important to take a perspective lodged in, again, the, uh, the interjection of, you know, future anticipation into a system to, in order to represent the dynamic processes that are ongoing. And in this, to this extent, you can have notions like uh, Bertolt Brecht's uh, notion of Entfremdung, alienation, the effect that uh, his uh, uh, theater, you know, the Caucasian chalk circle, whatever you have, uh, has on an audience uh, as a, uh, an event, a process that is again incurring on the minds of people. They leave the theater changed. So you have a gestalt shift in the sense this can be part of an anticipatory system that is incurring on the present on the basis of anticipation of the future by some artist or author. Again, this is my question. And I said isomorphism or similarity. I wasn't, you know, fetishizing any particular term. So in that sense, I think that the question at this point is to what extent are there real differences of views uh, among this group or to what extent are we just sort of talking past each other? That, that's a very important question. And I think, um, um, well, that's maybe that's the value of actually having a focus, uh, which is this book, and for us then to talk about our understanding of this book, because we will all have different understandings of it in different ways, I guess. Jamie? Yes. Um... Yes, so uh, it's interesting uh, that Jerome ends with the word identity and difference because, because it's exactly about how to work with difference uh, without uh, being threatened by the difference. And the identity, the desire for identity as kind of um, corrupted uh, our engagement with difference to say it in that way now in response to andrea um i was um, trying to get a quote uh from um uh, a book lynn segal 1986 second edition in 2001 the dream of reality heinz von furster's constructivism i don't know uh, how recently all of you have read the book there, George Bateson is quoted as saying, scientists are crazy. So, and then, of course, Lynn had to go and ask George Bateson what he meant by that uh, and what the double entendre was. And so he kind of set up uh, the snake eating its tail. Uh, so there was always a slipping away from exactly what it was that was being said. So I use deliberately the word double bind not to say that you loot was using the concept or that von Fuster was using i was just telling they were creating for us uh, for the outsiders a double bind and i use that snake as as an example this the whole idea of circular causality uh by this, the double bind, as I understand it in family therapy, is that you say one thing to the child and then your actions imply something else. And that uh, uh, Bateson's idea was that he was creating schizophrenia. And now, uh, interesting, mm -hmm. the French psychoanalysts uh, have played with this idea uh, further. And so, and so that's exactly just what I'm saying, that loot I'm not accusing Lou, I'm just saying the way the book is constructing, has he really thought about the two conflicting messages uh, and, and the two conflicting messages are the privileging of, of the computational metaphor as opposed to saying we need to talk more about metaphors. And for me, the example was just the lack of a lexicon uh, but but loot is caught in the middle of, of of a larger discussion in society about how to work with metaphors and and i should uh, as long as we don't have a lexicon we 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 will have trouble communicating and so and so i think george spencer brown is helping us explain the steps involved in creating a lexicon that is pay attention to the distinctions listen to the distinctions 
think about your own distinct oneself one's own distinctions clarified distinctions and um and so uh yeah so i i conclude my comment for now okay and andrea oh, yes very quickly i what i'm saying is that uh, I understand Jamie's work and I appreciate her contribution. She was very stimulating, so I'm not opposing to what she's saying. I'm just saying that uh, working on Luhmann's uh, uh, complex system self-referential um, theory and working uh, uh, on um, a uh, concept of double bind, uh, are two different paradigms or paradigms, I don't know how you pronounce it, um, which exclude one and the other. Lutz's book, my impression is that in his book, uh, the, the way he's following is much more Luhmann oriented, Luhmann's oriented than Bateson's oriented. So if we talk in general about double bind, uh, I uh, I can accept all different perspectives because we are aware we are talking about different uh, systemic paradigms. Yeah. But if we are introducing a kind of double bind approach in Lutz's book, uh, it's a different story. Yeah. I don't know if I am if I am clear. No, I, I completely agree. And I think one of the, um, I know one of the, uh, the, the key thing about the Lumen approach is that it's, it's trans individual. So, um, you know, Lumen isn't well, famously less interested in the individual than he is in the communication system. Bateson tends to be sort of focused on agency. It tends to be focused on the individual in some way. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, that, that isn't the way that... Exactly. Is. If you can... Yes, and I actually had a slide in which I was pointing out but there are two different uh, or maybe more than two streams in cybernetics <clears throat> and and that it is helpful to be aware of them and again that uh, for me gets back to the importance of the lexicons and i i started my presentation by pointing out uh this the Bates and concept of the runaway positive feedback circle because I think it's a nice neutral way of describing what's happening in society. And I understand it to mean that we need those lexicons. We cannot just say we don't need them because what? it's. Uh... Can you just explain what you mean, uh, Jamie? Because I mean, it, it, the thing that springs to my mind is that um, there's an awful lot of talk in the book about codes of communication. Is a lexicon a code of communication? Uh, a lexicon, insofar that I understand it, is literally a dictionary outside of any, whether it's Lumen, uh, Cybernetics, or Bateson. It's just a list of the terms using distinctions it's uh, okay uh, another way is think of it as a as a filing cabinet where you kind of say this is what is in this drawer this is what in this folder and so you kind of give a list what i see in lute's work he's already inside um a way of thinking that sounds like it's it's transhuman was that a term you used transpersonal Trans, trans individual, trans individual. I, trans individual. So he's thinking at the trans individual level, and I don't think he's asking the question: Is is that the way how society works? Is is that do people make all decisions? That, actually, maybe he does. But if he does, I I one hundred percent disagree. I, I think mm. humans are making decisions, and in the, and they do it as as uh, Bateson says. Is they're in these feedback loops, positive, negative, and the loops, the going back and forward is what leads to a decision. But it, 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 it is 
by looking at the human brain, so to say, and how the different parts work together and not at some trans level. Okay. I, I, I would just say, um, Andrea and Jerome are, are waiting to speak, but maybe your lexicon would actually operate as a code of communication. It's a way of coordinating expectations. I would have, I would suggest that's that's what that would amount to. That, that is one hundred percent true, but I don't think of myself as thinking of Shannon uh, model of communication. I use uh, more the Carl Bühler model that says the meaning is created inside my head, your head, Jerome's head, Jerry's head. Uh, who else is there? Lucas's head. We've all got heads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, you go inside the head. Yeah. And okay. then you simplify it and present it as a model. All right. Uh, the head. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Um, Andrea and then Jerome. Thank you again. Uh, okay. I understand the I understand the importance of the lexicon uh, and I agree about it. A shared lexicon uh, implies uh, not, I wouldn't say just one paradigm, but at least uh, a very neat uh, clarification among different uh, systemic paradigms. For example, I will be brief. In the WCSA conference I chaired in Lisbon last month, uh, we debated uh, about uh, uh, Lutz's book uh, and we also um, awarded uh, for his lifetime career success uh, Edgar Morens, Edgar Moren, who came in person uh, virtually by Zoom, uh, giving a speech. And I'm uh, perfectly aware that when uh, Lut says system uh, is not what what uh, Edgar Moren means by system. So. That's my opinion, at least, from the systemic paradigm they refer to. If it is the whole part paradigm, if it is a, a, a if it is an autopoietic focus paradigm, I can imagine among the three or four um, systemic paradigms, no more than that. So we can have a successful problem if we agree about uh, the paradigms. That's why epistemology once again wins on one side because you can shape lexicon without keeping the paradigm this data changes according to the paradigm, changes according to the different paradigm. Okay. Luman, you don't have a transpersonal community. Human, human beings are not in the system. Uh, human beings uh, produce noise. They communicate one, uh, one uh, to the other, each other, but they their communication never becomes systemic. That's why emergency in system is possible, but is statistically unlikely. Our huge amount of noise, uh, you get uh, three meaningful communications. And if you consider Luhmann's most important interlocutor, the interlocutors in the UK, for example, Michael King and Christopher Thornhill, it's very clear that, for example, Michael King authored the book titled Communication and Not People Make Systems. And communication is a, an, an endless flow from paradigm to data through lexicon. So that's why I think the epistemological challenges, uh, Lutz books, uh, books, sorry, are more important than the empirical data and empirical mathematization of the book itself. But this is just my opinion, of course. Mm. Okay. Jerem? Yeah, that's an interesting, or I would say a legitimate point of view uh, that Andrea just uh, espoused. And Again, other people, I think, are, are free to see things differently. I think that's the really interesting thing about uh, this book and this group of uh, people that we you know, have sort of gathered together to discuss it, because we all come from very, very different backgrounds, cultures, you know, um, countries, parts of the world, time zones, and so on. So I, I find all these conversations quite fascinating, even if I bring some critical views in sometimes. So to this last comment of Margareta's on, on, of the lexicon, 
I would say two things. Uh, in the first case, I would say that, um, you know, do it. <laughs> that could be your uh, contribution, uh, uh, Margarita uh, or Jamie. Uh, and I would say in general that, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, I would say in general that uh, Lutz, you know, the question is, you know, what, what is his intent here? I, I don't think his intent was to create lexicon. So you, you cannot, uh, you know, accuse someone of failing to do something that they're not trying to do. So I think his, uh, the question that motivated, motivated the book is that of, you know, what is evolving? So I, I think of this quote that he keeps citing in the book where, he, you know, the professor is crawling under the table and, uh, you know, he says, you know, what is evolving? And Lute is attempting to answer this question in terms of, you know, culture. So this move from political economy, where he has the two governing uh, uh, logics, as he says, to, you know, one that incorporates the communications view, and he has all these different, you know, evolutionary biology, you know, you have um, cybernetic system theory, phenomenology, and so, on, and so on. You know, all of the stuff that, that, that is brought into the, into the book. And I would say that instead of a lexicon, what we really need is something like uh, I used when I learned English, you know, my first language was German and I read, you know, bilingual uh, books. So we need some kind of a bilingual or trilingual or et cetera, uh, a way to apply the lessons, the, you know, if Andreas right, the epistemology that, that's presented in this book to different domains. You know, how does this apply in the domain of, uh, you know, uh, in, on the biological level, how does it apply on the communications, on the cultural, on the economic, and so on, uh, political levels. And so I think that's the job now for us. And I, I would just close with the reference that Klaus always makes, you know, what is the hierarchy, you know, to, you know how do we organize this, uh, this system? And uh, Andrea just mentioned autopoiesis, you know, is, is it self-organizing? Are we, you know, to this extent, you know, what, you know, agency are we uh, capable of in this sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, Jerry. Yeah, uh, Jerome, I, I think you you've you're coming closer to to what I would say uh, is a um, a rational approach to uh, trying to understand what Lute is talking about. But I think there the difficulty here uh, is captured by the concept of a lexicon. Uh, a lexicon as being the grounding for the system of logic that you choose to apply uh, so that a formal logical system necessarily requires a set of symbols and a, and a logic, uh, logical system of thought that allows you to draw conclusions. And it is that path to the conclusions that uh, depends on the lexicon. So if People start with different lexicons. Uh, they may have a very, very difficult time coming to the same conclusion. Although, you know, in, in terms of uh, Tarski, it's the conclusion that is important and the path of how you get there is less important. So uh, that part of it. Now, when you come to try and put these notions of analysis and synthesis, analysis to a lexicon and synthesis of a conclusion, it depends on how you uh, select terms for your lexicon. And this is where the divergence of this group is, is fantastic in the sense that the lexicon chosen by someone trained in, in economics uh, made more or less uses the metaphor, the physical terminology. Uh, people trained in biology are, are going to use more of a lexicon of chemistry. Uh, people trained in mathematics are going to use a lexicon of mathematical terminology. These are radically different lexicons. And searching for a common conclusion from the different lexicons is a challenging, challenging task. It, it actually, Jerry, I wonder if it takes us back to Andrea's example, the lovely example about Nostradamus. And, you know, you can imagine not just one Nostradamus. Let's, let's say we've got a hundred Nostradamuses, each armed with a lexicon telling them what a skyscraper is, an airplane, television, uh, what clothes are. How do they coordinate their understanding? How do they actually, how do they even uh, reach an understanding of what those things are in, in the abstract? It surely must be a communication system. There must be some kind of coordination of their understanding, their situation, 
and um, some mechanism for coordinating it. I would have thought. <laughs> uh, so, um... I could give you a very long, long response to that question of the consistency of correspondence between different lexicons. And the bottom line is it, I, I, no, I take that back. The opportunity for creative imaginations and creative fantasies of how things are related to one another is unbounded. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the fantasy of the individual and their capacity to imagine how things fit together. Uh, that's, and, and perhaps the good example here is, is the very deep similarity between the, the lexicon of uh, chemistry and the lexicon of music. And yet the ordinary person would see these things as very, very dramatically different. One being grounded in emotions and the other being grounded in, in abstract diagrams. So it, it's, but it's, I, I, I think that's approaching where the uh, reality of living as a human being is. Mm. Okay. Jamie? Yes. Um, I come to this all from uh, strategic management, and there was one article uh, published in a journal called The Unobservable. So the entire article was dedicated to explaining that managers, they just sit in their office or they're playing golf. They do nothing at all, yet they pay millions now. Why? Well, because they actually do a lot, but it's invisible. And it's not because it's invisible, it doesn't matter. It's actually very important and they use metaphors. So that is the way I really got into this topic of metaphors and I couldn't help but notice how I, I don't I don't see really there's an effort to to point out how to work with or maybe it's there but I haven't found a translation key yet. But so what I'm would like to do now is actually give a shout out to Jason because um Jerome made a comment and actually I should know Jerome and I we know each other for like um since two thousand and nine or something. So he, he said, why don't you create a lexicon? The whole point of what I'm trying to say is you cannot just create a lexicon. And that's what Jerry was saying. Is you need actually people working together to create a lexicon. And you cannot say you're in charge, like this discipline is in charge. No, we all need to work together. I mean, because no one is in charge. I mean, that's the whole point of um, self-organizing. It's like, it's, it's the give and take that kind of naturally arises. And now, uh, I mean, this is just so visual uh, to actually point out that there is a huge literature on, on talking circles and, and all the difficulty of, of having round table discussions. And then I also would like to give a shout out to Jason and the club of Remy because he basically started this discussion as a round table discussion like uh, two years ago now um this that i kind of see uh, as an attempt to to um to to set up this interdisciplinary thinking that is needed and and i would like to do also do a shout out to Stuart Umpleby who has been trying i don't know for how many years to alert Americans to the need to educate themselves on European philosophy and to, and that he says people listen politely and then they walk away. So, so they're not doing anything. And, and he is, is kind of um, making this argument also this, this interdisciplinary thinking where we really listen. And as I understand it today, <laughs> It's like the, the apartment building model of interdisciplinary research, like each discipline has its own floor and they all set their own rules and they have their own organizations, but there is nothing that's trying to tell us how to work across disciplines. And so I want to do a shout out to Jason and, and Stuart Humbleby for 
creating a context to take us think interdisciplinary and then of course Lourdes is giving us a beautiful book to practice thinking okay. interdisciplinary okay um i can't i uh, jerome i think you're next it's the, it's the piano sonata well Sorry. i guess it has too many chapters for a piano sonata Lourdes book i mean no i was using a metaphor um <laughs> um <clears throat> Uh, by the way, Jamie, just to respond very, very quickly, I did say do it. I did not use the pronoun, so I didn't necessarily imply you do it. I could have been we do it or they do it or someone else. Do it. Anyway, so I don't mean to nitpick. Um, and I think you raised an interesting question there, Jamie, by the way, and also Jerry before that, which is the issue of, I guess we've called it here innovation, but you could also use the word initiative. And I think you do have a certain um, they could be processes, they could also be individuals, unique individuals, you know, in biology, you call them mutations, who then introduce new, whatever it is, uh, events, processes into the world, whether it be Jason with the Club of Remy, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, Lute with his book, whether it be, you know, whatever, you know, many, many, it, it actually, actually, one particular example that I wanted to mention is um, also an article by, I think it's Kyriasis and Metaxas, two Greek, in this case, economists, who are studying the history or the development of democracy in Athens or in the uh, Greek uh, Dark Ages. And they uh, use a term like, um, um, I think it's called macrocultures, macrocultures uh, on the basis of the hoplite warfare that also Max Weber talks about, which you know, required uh, uh, citizens or individuals to, to um, defend themselves after the collapse of Mycenae. And you had this, uh, you know this uh, this dependency of uh, the city of the polis on the you know farmers who were you know also the army uh, and they got a sense that in fact we need representation we need also to participate in the governing and why am i defending my city without having a say so this is being a a, a generate a, a a a motor to generate a sense of uh, entitlement to participate so that, that is being a motor for initiative, for innovation. And who is responsible? What is responsible? How do these processes start? And I think we have a great group here to discuss the, exactly these types of dynamics. But I think they're very important. OK. I agree. Um, and, Andrea, do you have your hand up again? Yes, but once again, I'll be try, try to be quick. Uh, let me just, uh, OK. Yes. Uh, um, once again, very nice and stimulating comments. If we want to work on the concept of lexicon, I think we need to, for example, uh, avoid the hyper differentiation and specialization. Mm -hmm. Back to Popper, in the worst case, we should share, we should distinguish, sorry, among uh, um, hard sciences, uh, political and social sciences, uh, and uh, humanities. The more we uh, are specific about, for example, the language of chemistry, the language of economics, uh, the language of uh, law, the language of physics, uh, the more we will be specific with the terms of the lexicon, the more it will not work. Yes. This is my, my training and my education. I will be brief about my biographies. I, I will not tell you my life, don't worry. Uh, my, my, bio, my, my biography, very quick, uh, is the one of a sociologist. Uh, and in general, uh, mm -hmm. suggest of law, legal studies. Mm -hmm. When I was at the very beginning of my academic studies, uh, Nicholas Luhmann, I used to come to Bologna where I was a student uh, and I had the chance, to, I don't say working because it would be false, but studying and learning directing from his seminars and conferences. Also because I'm lucky enough to have also German roots and I also speak German a little bit. So I could understand also some terms, philosophically speaking, you know which were more specific than the English translation. What I'm, what I'm saying is that very briefly, when we work in lawmaking, which is a typical uh, work for systemic thinkers in sociology of law, Luhmann began as a sociologist of law. 
is a theory began as a theory of a differentiation of law, and then he moved around. When you, when you work about law, you work about uh, uh, a structural coupling with politics sometimes, uh, a kind of illusion of a double bind uh, in which you expect politics uh, to shape what law will formalize, uh, as if uh, law were a kind of mathematics uh, among social sciences. And it's not exactly so, it's not like that. Uh, for example, consider the debate about the rights of gays, lesbians, uh, transgender, and whatever. Whatever you think about it, uh, uh, politically, if you need to have uh, a wider a range of rights, uh, you don't need a more specific legal lexicon. You need a more general epistemological uh, and legal concept. For example, you, you don't need to create a special laws and regulations uh, if the couple is made of uh, two women, two men, uh, a man who was a woman, a woman who was a man, and so forth. You don't need to specify this. You just need to, need to write an article uh, in, a, in a law which states that the marriage is based on the couple, full stop. You need to generalize, uh, not to specify, not to differentiate, differentiate. So the more, if the lexicon is a tool to, uh, to link a general, more general concepts to more general terms, lexicon can be paradigms. Mm. If lexicon uh, begins to, to to cut, 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 cut everything in smaller and smaller species, uh, lexicon, lexicon will be a disaster. That's my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree. Very true. Now, uh, Gerard you. and Lucas, we haven't heard from you, so perhaps. Oh, sorry. I I. The, the first, Andrea, I, I completely agree with your last statement about the, the cutting up. That is the end of the, that's the worst case uh, thing to do. But having said that, um, Gerard or Lucas, we haven't heard from you. Gerard, do you have any comments? Um. <clears throat> Not really for two reasons. One is I haven't read the chapter, so I feel a little bit out of the discussion, but on the other hand, a number of the issues that came up are very interesting to me. Um, one of the things that I, uh, one of the issues that was raised in my mind is that I couldn't actually make a good distinction between two types of things. One is we can say, for example, I make a distinction or we can say um, the fact that I point to a distinction in my environment makes it possible for me to think about distinctions. So in that sense, I'm still at a very uh, primitive level and therefore I prefer to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I would like to make at least one more comment, uh, since I uh, uh, <laughs> I also enjoy listening, but I also uh, perhaps say too much sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the, the, the situation that, that Andreas has raised with regard to how fine do you dice things up when you're communicating is really a very, very, very important issue. Uh, now, my training and experience comes much of it at the interface between uh, government regulations, that is law, and the enforcement of laws, and the practice of medicine, and uh, or the notion of human health and how it's influenced by the environment. And uh, in this case, uh, the regulations that are necessary for social 
uh, safety and health or social risk analysis or, or whatever you want to terminology, you, whatever lexicon you choose there. Uh, but the basic idea is that the idea of health regulations uh, are to protect the general population. It's part of the community activity, uh, the, the social structure. And of course, the, the virus uh, pandemic has illustrated this beyond belief in terms of the importance of uh, appropriate regulations to protect the general population. So how finally you dice depends a great deal on which social problem you're, or social issue you're trying to address. And uh, when it comes to the, shall we say the variants of the coronavirus, <laughs> How finely diced is that language? How the lexicon for the coronavirus, which was almost zero, it didn't even have a name when it escaped, to now one is talking about at least a, at least a thousand different variants in the lexicon of the coronavirus. And all of this has come about in two or three years. Uh, so yeah, this issue of lexicon is a very complicated one. And for some purposes, like sexual relationships between uh, human beings, you may want a very, very crude lexicon, uh, such that you, uh, you don't really address the basic issues, you just allow the political system to operate within that lexicon. Uh, and that is all that is needed uh, in that case. Of course, it doesn't, solve the political problem at all. It just uh, says, well, that's what we're going to call law. You, you cannot do that with the coronavirus. You, you, cannot, you simply, the, the factual nature of the situation is, it's there and, and you have to cope with it in some fashion or another. Whether you do that by metaphor, by uh, uh, belief systems about the value of different medicines, whether you deal with it with regulations or you deal with it with lockdown, these are all political issues seeking to address uh, the nature of the coronavirus and human pandemics. I, I stopped there. Okay, I think, um, I think uh, it's approaching uh, time to stop. Um, just very quickly then, can I turn to our last two speakers just to sum up very, very quickly? Uh, yes. So just starting, Jamie. Yeah, so uh, I, I wanna follow up with what Andrea said about cutting up uh, smaller and smaller distinctions. Uh, when, you, when you read George Spencer Brown, the first three pages, he points out the three metaphors that we use while talking about the distinction this one is the cleavage uh, that I, I hear a lot that is that you cut up the Plato's butcher, cutting up, uh, cutting nature at the joint, so to say. And then the two others are the circle in the sand and then uh, the container metaphor when he says uh, distinction is perfect continence. Um, as I understand it, since we have been talking about lexicons and, 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 and the value, if, if Lute would have somewhere a lexicon, um, when we read George Spencer Brown's book, uh, it can be read in three different manners, pointing out three different types of lexicons. One lexicon is about human communication, communicating with each other. So that's in the midst of us communicating that we try to develop the lexicon. But then the two others are machine language. That is when you design a machine to do what it is supposed to do. This is a very different lexicon. And then the third one are logics that is that are the the logicians who 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 uh, come up with rules to work with symbols to understand the property of the rules and so george spencer brown is is using the the distinction and he actually is developing this a lexicon for the logician who wants to work with the distinction but you, he can also be read as as designing a machine language 
But then he's actually also communicating with other humans. And you see that in chapter three. And so um, what I'm trying to say, there is hope for a lexicon that, that we need to make sure we're not developing a machine language lexicon, that we're actually developing a, a human communication lexicon and that we also um, just do not hold the logicians uh, hostage when they try to do their novelty logics uh, that can actually have very significant uh, contributions for society. So, um, so in the spirit of that, I think that Lourdes is trying to contribute to the lexicon of humans communicating with each other in the midst of a communication. And I, thanks to you, Andrea, I understand better. So Lourdes is criticizing human, but it's not exactly identifying yet with uh, George uh, Gregory Bateson. So it's somewhere in the middle. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Andrea. Andrea, yeah. May I? Yes. Closing words to you. Yeah, very closing word, but a very short one. Uh, linking to, I think, Jason, the gentleman quoting the COVID. Uh, Gary. As a sociologist, uh, I want to, uh, to emphasize why I was focused much more on epistemology than on data, also in Let's Book. Because uh, at the moment, uh, I'm talking as a sociologist, not as a doctor in medicine. I'm not a biologist, I'm not a doctor in medicine, so I don't talk about the health side. We have a gigantic amount of useless data about COVID. Because we have a gigantic amount of data, including about deaths, people who died for COVID, and they are totally, totally, totally unreliable. Why? Because at the beginning, uh, the pandemic generated, uh, of course, a high, high risk and high emergency reaction. That's normal, that's, uh, you know. But uh, in my opinion, what didn't work at the very beginning also was uh, that uh, um, the World Health Organization should have uh, conceptualized, categorized, and classified immediately the concept of death by COVID. It didn't work like that. So in every state, in every region, in every municipality, in every hospital, when a person died, they in a certain way creatively classified that person. So for example, if you were a man in his late 90s, with two ictus, a liver cancer, and COVID, in Germany, the, 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 the death cause was classified as age, because this man was 95, for example. In Italy, the same exact case, a man of 95 with a liver cancer with a, to heart attacks and COVID uh, was classified as a death by COVID. So counting the deaths of COVID, uh, the policy modeling and the social and political management of health, uh, not the medical one, and also the media representation of uh, the risk uh, was based on data, which had no reason to live, to, to, to exist. So that's why epistemology wins on empirical data, because if you are wrong in conceptualizing and then in classifying and so forth, and then in setting the index indexicals, then the outcome, the variable, is the result not of the scenario, is the result of your construction. So that's why I think also in Let's Book, the focus, that's my opinion, of course, should be much more on the epistemological framework he provides than the, than the technical uh, mathematical uh, data aspects. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. Okay, all right, that's, that's, that's a very powerful um, example. And, and thank you so much for, um, for both contributions. 
Um, what's the next session, Jamie? We're on to chapter nine. You're muted, I think. Jamie? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I need to look at my notes and I hope to find them. Actually, I don't have them with me. Um, I don't recall. So the, the next... <laughs> uh, Gerard, I believe you will be... Uh, commenting in June, is that correct? The only thing I know is I'm chapter 10. Uh, you chapter 10, so you are in July. Um, yes. All right, so let me um, find the email. So, uh, okay, this is all going a little slow. I, yeah, I, I wish um, to I'm looking. Please, Jamie. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm. It's the... yeah, I found. Go ahead. I I found the correct. Um, so the next session is June 15, Chapter Nine, Subdynamics in Knowledge-Based Systems, and we get uh, comments from Igone Porte Gomez uh, from the University de Deusto from Spain engineering and organization and then also caroline wagner from ohio state uh, public affairs and now there will be two more sessions uh, in july uh, the 20th uh, that is christian gephardt and gerard the same that's on cultural and biological evolution and then we have the closing chapter in august and at the moment i have jerome down as a contributors uh, as a discussant um, but there may be other people also joining all okay. right so all right I so made... if i if i may... yeah go ahead I'll... excuse me um Mark, do, would you do the closing comments, um, the, the final, final comments? The, what, in August? No, uh, no, what I'm trying to... Oh, the, what, today? Yeah, okay. Um, no, this is great. So, so thank you ever so much. I think, um, I think this is, this is a, a, a very interesting chapter. I think it is ambitious, and I think it's really... Um, it's exposed, it's exposed something among ourselves, which has been very interesting today. So, um, so thank you for that. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, all right, thank you very much, bye-bye. I'm gonna follow Andrea's advice and go outside now. Enjoy the nice weather, bye. Excuse me? <laughs> I said I'm going outside. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for the discussion. All right, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you very much. I wish I can attend also the further events. Uh, because, for example, chapter seven, uh, while you were discussing it, I was opening the conference in Lisbon. Yes. Mm. So I had bad luck because it was the same day. I know. So it's... I have to attend also the further meetings. And thank you very much, everybody, mm. for your patience and attention to my contribution thank you very much thank i'm very you. open to further dialogues conversations and projects so okay. please just let me know thank you very much okay thank All you right. very much bye-bye bye-bye bye-bye